So on this exam, it is a little bit different than the first exam. Um, I think that the integrals involved are a lot simpler because the first exam was all about techniques of integration. So we really wanted to challenge you with the integration. This exam is about application, so it's a different goal. And so we're not going to try to throw you an integral which is ridiculously hard. In fact, I would say that on the whole, almost all the integrals involved, and there aren't that many. There's a lot less than you, will, you would think going into this test. Um, none of them are really very hard, as long as you set it up correctly. Maybe one or two exceptions towards the end. On a side note, the, uh, I, I don't know if you want me to tell you, tell you this, but um, the, uh, the instructor said, you know, let, let's challenge ourselves. Let's see how well we, we can predict what the students will think is, is easy and what the students will think is hard. And so they said, all right, we're going we're gonna to arrange the problems. Easy to hard. Number one, we think that's the easiest. Number two, second easiest, so forth and so on. You know which two I wrote? Five and six. That's me. So you'll know when you hit five and six, there's going to be a definite change in tone. So, however, I think my problems are the most beautiful and people are going to enjoy them. And so I am optimistic that you'll do well. I, I, I hold out high hopes. And if nothing else, I have the best picture on the exam. You'll have to wait and see. All right. So, um, but what I want to say is don't worry about the computations. The computations are not the hard part. That's not where you're going to lose points. Where you're going to lose points is the setup. This exam is about setting things up. Do you know how to get the right integrals? And I haven't yet gotten the full point breakdown, but my estimate is 40 out of 60 points happens before you do integration. So in other words, it's all about can you set the integrals up? So focus on that. <clears throat> now part of that comes down to understanding what things are. And so the way I remember things is I tend not to memorize formulas in this format. Now, if you tell me to write it down, I'll, I, I do write it down in that way, but that's not how I think about it. What I prefer to do is say, look, what do the pieces mean? Well, pi obviously is pi, but this f of x squared, well, that's really a radius, because what I'm thinking about is spinning and making a radius. The dx is a little bit of thickness, and I say, oh, this is a, a little disk I formed, and it's the volume of a disk, and integration is just a fancy way of saying add stuff up. So if, when I remember the formulas in that regard, it's very easy to adapt. So if we change the situation slightly, it's OK. I know how to adapt because I know what everything represents. And if you don't know what things represent, you can't adapt. So try to make sure you understand what the formulas are. And that will help you do fairly well. Um, the general advice is, is still the same. Make sure you have plenty of rest. Don't try to. Stay up till like 4 a.m. watching the videos. I know some people do, because I can keep track. Uh, it's not the best plan. Make sure you know the ideas. Don't panic. Or if you choose to panic, try to get your panic done in the first minute or two of the test so that you can then relax and enjoy the rest of your test. <laughs> it's OK to be a little nervous, but it passes. Uh, don't get stuck on ones too long. If you get stuck on number five, go to number six. And if you get stuck on number six, go back to number five. You know, it's OK. Um, sometimes you'll discover that as you move through the test, it's like, oh, certain ideas, as you work one problem, remind you of like, oh, there's this related idea to help me get another problem. So it's not bad to, to move around if you're, if you're not making progress. It's perfectly fine. It's a reasonable thing to do. Make sure to check your work. When you're ever asked to integrate, the integrals will work. I know it. it when you're going to get to a certain point towards the end of the test, and you're like, there's no way this integral is going to work. Then you're like, wow, it works. I promise. When you see the solution, you'll be like, so that's how it worked. But actually, even better, without seeing the solution, you're going to be like, aha, he can't get me. I'm one step ahead of him. So anyways. And number six, 
I know it's a hard to believe after the first test, but I still want to say it. Look, we don't judge you as a person based on your test. A little bit we judge you as a mathematician. As a person, no, you're still wonderful people. And so we're not, we're not mad at you, we're not sad. We just want you to do well. And we still want you to, to be good and do the best that you can. That's my general advice. The rest of the time will be spent going over the practice exam. So this is sort of your last chance to, to try to pry any information that you can out of me. Ask leading or misleading questions where I give leading or misleading responses. I'm very good at the ambiguous responses. All right, so we're going to go through and do one of the practice exams. And uh, I would strongly encourage you to be familiar with both of them. Which is not to say that we're going to just copy problems directly from the practice exams, but you'll see types of problems on the exam which you'll say, oh, they're echoes of things that showed up on the practice exams, which is why we want you to be able to do these problems. And it's not like one exam is superior to the other. Do both. And you'll discover that there's almost no overlap between the two, which means that there's a lot of stuff that we've done, so you have to know quite a lot of material. So here we go. Six problems and we have uh, 35 minutes left. Good challenge. Wait, 35? No, we got 45. Man, that's plenty of time. But here we go. All right. Find the volume which results from rotating the region 3x to the 8th sine of x cubed less than or equal to y less than or equal to 3x to the 8th sine of x cubed plus e to the x. And, and sort of like in the back of my head, it's like, you know, in a pinch, I bet you I could figure out how to do that. But man, that seems like an ugly function. And these are supposed to be beautiful problems. I'm suspicious here when I see ugly things showing up in beautiful problems. All right. Well, let's think about it. I don't know exactly what 3x to the 8th sine of x cubed does, but it probably does something like this. So there's my lower function. And then I'm, the, the upper function is almost the same. I'm just adding something which is growing. So it's the same, but it's growing up. So it's you know, vaguely something like that. Now, do I need a picture? No, but a picture helps. And I'm rotating around the line x equals negative 1. So here's that line x equals negative 1. Now, I stop and I think, well, if I'm looking for a volume, and it's a volume found by rotating, then I think there's two methods that I've learned to do volumes with involved rotation. One is the shell method, and one is the washer method. Both work. However, both are not equally good in all situations. In some situations, one is strongly preferable to the other. In this situation, as it's written here, I really have these functions as y is a function of x, which would make me think, well, what if I were to try something where I just do a dx integral? So in other words, my slice is if I were thinking integrating with respect to x, would be these little tiny thin pieces, which if I spun these around, would become little shells. So I'm thinking that this problem seems really well set up to do the shell method. So I'm going to approach it with the shell method. So OK, so I think about the shell method formula. Volume is 2 pi integral a to b. Then there's a radius and a height. And I'll go ahead and call it a thickness, the thickness of your shell. Now, for us, the thickness we're integrating with respect to x, that's my dx. My 2 pi is 2 pi. I have two pieces left, the radius, the height. Now, the radius is what? Well, I'm here at x, and I want to go to x equals negative 1. So it's that distance between negative 1 and x. What is that distance? x plus 1. OK, and now one more piece, the height. Well, we finally have to face these complicated functions head on. So the height is going to be the difference between the upper curve and the lower curve. So in other words, this length is the height. Well, how do we find height? Top minus bottom. Seems pretty reasonable. OK, so the height is going to be the top, 3x to the 8th sine of x cubed 
plus e to the x minus the bottom, 3 to the x to the 8th sine of x cubed. And what do you notice? Cancellation. Oh, so this really terrible, ugly part isn't needed. So in fact, the integral becomes very pleasant. It's the type of integral that you'd like to take home to meet your parents. All right. So where are we going from? Zero to three. Because it says it right here. X goes zero to three. X plus one, e to the x, dx. So that's not a bad integral. Now, we actually have to find it. This is not a setup problem. This is a find problem. So we have to go all the way. Now, one thing we could do is say, well, I know what the integral of x plus 1 e to the x is. And if we didn't know it, we could just do, uh, well, what technique? What's the right technique here? By parts. By parts. Yeah, so if we set, for example, u to x plus 1, dv, e to the x dx, du is dx, and v is e to the x. So um, 2 pi, and this would be uv, x plus 1, e to the x, of course going from 0 to 3, minus the integral v du, that's the integral 0 to 3, e to the x, dx. So it's 2 pi, I have x plus 1, e to the x, and I'll go ahead and write this down, the integral of v to the x is e to the x, and all that's from 0 to 3, but really, if you look, it's really x e to the x. So it simplifies. The antiderivative of x plus 1 e to the x is x e to the x. And if you plug in 0, you get 0. So you plug in 3, well, that's 3 times 2 pi, that's 6 pi e cubed. And we're done. We're done. Okay. On a side note, we said there were two methods. There was shell method. Could we have done washer method? Theoretically, yes. Practically, not a chance in hell. Excuse my language. But why do I say that? Well, to do that, I'd have to find all these little tiny pieces here. Because there's all these little, I'd have to find where all these maxes are, all these mins are, find the, the, the inverse functions. Not a chance I could do it. I mean, I could fill up page after page of, you know, ever increasing amounts of profanity as I, I get stumped. But it just says, look, some methods work better than others. And so use the right method. Take a second and think about what's the easy method to use. All right, on to number two. So number two, switch gears. So we started with the geometry. We're going to keep in geometry a little bit. But now it's find the length. So find the length around this curve. So what is that curve? x to the 2 thirds plus y to the 2 thirds equals 1. It's a little bit jagged because we didn't add enough points here when we drew it. But, but you can imagine it, it, it's actually a pretty smooth curve. So this is the curve. We've actually saw this before in an example. And it says, hey, you know what you could do is let's just focus on one piece. So if I focus on this piece over here, this first quadrant, if I were to solve for y, if you did that, you would get this expression. I don't have to because they actually gave it to us. So it turns out that for this part, this is y equals 1 minus x to the 2 thirds raised to the 3 halves power. So what we're really doing here is we're solving for this arc length, and then we're going to multiply by 4. OK. Well, so we start. So we have length is 4, integral a to b, I'll just write down our generic formula. And do you remember how to do arc length? Yeah, there's a square root involved. And then what comes next depends on what context you're in. If you're in parameterized curves, for instance, there's one context. That's where it's x prime squared plus y prime squared. If you're in the, the setting where it's y equals something of x, well, and that is what we are. You can think of this as our f of x then it's 1 plus f prime of x quantity squared dx. And the idea is that this piece right here is just the length of a small piece. So that you, you, you sliced your, your curve that you're looking for, this piece here, into the little tiny parts. And you can find the length of one small part. And then, of course, you add them up. 
the 4 coming because we're multiplying by 4. Okay, so for us, let's write this down. 4 integral 0 to 1, square root of 1 plus, and now we're just going to be careful here. 3 halves comes down because we're taking derivative. 1 minus x to the 2 thirds to the 1 half. Okay, am I done? No. Oh, well, what, what comes next? Yeah, take through to the inside, which is minus, and then 2 thirds x to the negative 1 third. Now are we done? Squared. Dx. Okay, good. All right. Now this is sort of a patience. You know, don't get panicked. Don't try to get too far ahead of ourselves. We just sort of say, let's work the problem. One bit at a time. The 3 halves, 2 thirds, cancel. The minus, I'm squaring it. Doesn't make a difference. It's really like a plus. Now, what does that tell us? 4 integral 0 to 1. And what do I have? Square root of 1 plus, and here this 1 half, when I square it, goes away, so it's 1 minus x to the 2 thirds. And this x negative 1 third really is downstairs, but I've squared it, so it's x to the 2 thirds. All right. I haven't done any integration yet. I'm still in my simplify mode. Because that's oftentimes, when you're doing arc length problems, 90% of the work is figuring out what happens underneath that square root. And in particular, how do you get rid of it? And the other 10% is just like, easy, enjoy. And I was like, woohoo, I got through the hard part. So take your time on the inside. Do you see anything that we can do? OK, I can add things. Common denominator, x to the 2 thirds plus 1 minus x to the 2 thirds over x to the 2 thirds dx. Well, what happens? The x to the 2 thirds cancel. Almost as if it was just set up for that to happen. And if you stare at this, in fact, it becomes something very, very nice. Upstairs, it's 1, so it's just 1. Downstairs, it's square root of x to the 2 thirds, and the square root of x to the 2 thirds is x to the 1 third, but it's downstairs. And so that's x to the minus one-third dx. Now, on a side note, we've done the hard part. We've dealt with the square root. We got rid of it. Is there anything about this integral that we think, hmm, this might possibly not be proper? Anything at all? At zero, it blows up. This is an improper integral. And what are we going to do? We're just going to keep our eye on it. We're going to be like, I've got my eye on you. Don't go too crazy, but we'll keep going forward. OK, so what's the integral of, of uh, x to negative 1 third? x to what power? 2 thirds. And then 3 halves. And then I'm going to go from 0 to 1. Now, I know 0 is improper, so I really should say what happens as I go to 0. But now, x to 2 thirds as I go to 0, what does it do? It's 0. Good. It went away. Sometimes if you just sort of keep your eye on it, it takes care of itself. What happens upstairs? 1 to the 2 thirds? Goes to 1. So final answer? 6. We're done. Two problems down. Doing great. How are you guys doing? All right. Hopefully they're all this easy, right? So, so find two parameters, A and B, so that the region 0 less than or equal to Y less than or equal to X to the A. So in other words, we have to choose our region depending on our choice of A. So if A is, is say, a half, it would look like this. If A was 1, it would look like this. If A was 2, it would look like that, and so forth and so on. So there's lots of possible regions. So we have to pick our shape to achieve a certain effect, but we also have to pick our density. But what is, how are we going to make our choice? And the answer is we want to make sure our center of mass ends up at a very particular location. 
So I have two coordinates here for center of mass. Well, this is one of those ones where we just sit down and we, we work our way through it. And we say, all right, let's think about center of mass. Center of mass, oftentimes written x bar, y bar, that's given to us. Uh, it's 6 over 7, comma 3 over 8. So we want that to be the following. We want that to be m sub y over m and m sub x over m. So that's our goal, is to figure out, okay, see what these are, and let's figure out what that says we need to say about A and B. So what do we get to do? Well, we get to do three integrals, m, m sub x, and m sub y. So center of mass problems, it's like a three for one. It's like, no, 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 I don't want to do just one integral, I want to do three. Cool, 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 cool. So, but the good news is that they're almost all identical. So for mass, how do you do mass? Well, mass is the integral between your endpoints, A and B, of density times area. Now I say area here because it's a, a two-dimensional region. And so in our case, what is it going to be? I probably shouldn't use A and B, but A and B should represent something different here. Zero and one, what's our density? x to the b. I don't know what, it, what b is, but it's still x to the b. What's the area? Well, the area is like one of these slices. So it's the height, x to the a, dx. Well, how do we go about integrating x to the b times x to the a? Do we use like some sort of uh, integration by parts or something more complicated? Or Yeah, it's x to the a plus b. And the integral of x to the a plus b is 1 over a plus b plus 1. x to the a plus b plus 1, evaluated from 0 to 1, which becomes 1 over a plus b plus 1. OK, 1 down, 2 to go. Now, the next one is a moment. So we'll take a moment here to collect ourselves and get the right setup. So let's do a moment with respect to y first. So in that one, in that moment, I'll switch these alphas and betas. There we go. Uh, what is that? Well, what's the only thing that happens different with the moment? So a moment has distance. That's the only difference. And you can't see that. But that is the word distance right there. I'm pointing to it right now. Distance. I know what it looks like. DI squiggle, but it's really distance. Okay, so yeah, now they have to think about what distance, because there's two distances that we could have. It depends on which axis we're going to. Now, in our case, which axis are we going to? If we're going to M sub Y, we're going to which axis? Which axis? Y, because that tells you what the axis it is, but what's the distance? X. Because we want to confuse you. No, 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 no. It's just that's the way the system works. The y value measures how much you go along the y-axis. The x value measures how far you are from the y-axis. So in our case, the only thing different here is we add an x. And then we still have x to the b, and we still have x to the a dx. So this is almost the same integral. It's x to the a plus b plus 1. So what does that become? 1 over a plus b plus 2, x to the a plus b plus 1. Evaluate well, from 0 to 1, plus 2, thank you, and there you go. So it's almost identical, just a, a plus 1 difference. Okay, so maybe the last one will also be just another plus 1 difference. Or will it? We're about to find out. Okay, so... Here, we just adapt. 0 to 1, we still have density is x to b. We still have area is x to the a dx. But now distance. This is the one you have to think about. What's the right distance? It's the y. That should be what goes there. Because you're talking about distance with respect to the x-axis, which is the quote unquote y. But where is the y value? Do you remember where to put the y value, how to find it? 
it's one half, in particular, it's halfway in between the top and the bottom curve. So if this is your bottom curve, this is your top curve, it's halfway in between. So if our bottom curve is zero, and our top curve is x to the a, the halfway in between those is one half x to the a. So that would be what the y value becomes. So this becomes one half integral zero to one, add up your exponents, it's x to the two a plus b dx. Okay, so that's one half, and then we get one over two a plus b plus one, x to the two a plus b plus one, evaluated from zero to one, which evaluated at zero, you get zero, evaluated at one, so you get one over, and I'll go ahead and multiply that two downstairs, two times 2a plus b plus 1. Okay, now, with all this work, are we done? No! But it feels like we've done a lot of work, and so we'll get partial credit. But we don't want partial credit, we want full credit. We're going all in. We're going to finish this problem. So what do we do to finish it up? Well, we're going to set up our relationships. So 6 sevenths, that should equal m sub y over m. So I look at m sub y, that's 1 over a plus b plus 2, and I look at m, 1 over a plus b plus 1, and I say, aha, that's going to be a plus b plus 1 over a plus b plus 2. That's what it'll become. So to think about it, because I'm dividing by m, I'm multiplying by the reciprocal. So that's how that a plus b plus 1 went upstairs. Another way to say this is if I cross multiply 6a plus 6b plus 12 equals 7a plus 7b plus 7. <coughs> and if I subtract the 6a and the 6b and I subtract the 7, I can conclude that a plus b better be 5. Now, that's one condition. That's the condition I need if I want to make sure that my x coordinate for my center of mass is in the right location. I also have my y coordinate. So 3 eighths, that's m sub x over m, which is going to be a plus b plus 1 divided by 2 times 2a plus b plus 1. Again, m sub x over m. Think of the m as multiplying by the reciprocal. We cross multiply. So if we cross multiply here, three times this expression, it's like I'm multiplying six through, so that's 12a plus 6b plus six equals 8a plus 8b plus eight. Hmm, hmm. Well, okay, we can move stuff around. Uh, 4a, if I move the 8a across, uh, plus two, no, 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 no. 4a, sorry, uh, equals b plus 2. 2b plus 2. I have to think about it. Is it 2b or is it not 2b? It is 2b, yes. Or 2a equals b plus 1. Okay, so that's my second relationship. a plus b equals 5. 2a equals b plus 1. I feel like I'm close. How do I finish up? Yeah, two equations, two unknowns. So here's one thing I could do. I could say, for example, b equals 2a minus 1, and plug it in up here. So I get a plus 2a minus 1 equals 5. 3a equals 6. So what is a? 2. All right, a is 2. 2 plus b equals 5. What is b? 3. And then I box it so they know where to look for my answer because this was a lot of work. So I want to make sure I box it so they can unmistakably see, aha, this person had the right answer. They must have done all the, all the work right. Full points for them. Okay, <sighs> that's a good one. Whew. How'd you do? We're halfway through, and we still have 20 minutes, so we're doing great. And you get like the full 75. I'm doing this on, on speed run. All right, here we go. So, before becoming the supreme leader of the first order, Snoke was an engineer working on reducing the number of accidental blow-ups of Death Stars. 
Along the way, he created a new type of spring where the amount of force required to stretch the spring a distance of x feet from resting, resting was k times root x pounds for some constant k. This is now known as Snoke's Law. Now given that the amount of work to stretch the new spring a distance of one foot from resting is six foot pounds, find the amount of work required to stretch the spring a distance of four feet from resting. Okay, well, what do we have? Well, it talks about here, uh, the amount of work to stretch this spring one foot from resting. Well, we know how much force is required at any given point, and we know that work is the adding up of force times distance. So, as they would say, we're going to use the force. Now, in our case, what is the force? Well, uh, it's probably something about, what is it, minochlorians or, is that what it's called? I don't remember. But, but that was just a silly, crazy Qui-Gon. All right, in our case, it's really K root X. Distance is the DX. It's just I'm like stretching the spring and I just think about every little tiny piece along the way is a DX, zero to one. So that's the amount of work it takes for me to stretch this spring one foot. Well, I'm told that's equal to six. So let's see, what does this become? The K is a constant, integral zero to one, X to one half DX. So what's the integral of X to one half? X to three halves and two thirds from zero to one. So this becomes two thirds times K. Well, that's equal to six. So that tells us what our constant is. So our constant is six times three halves, which is nine. Well, so that's what was given, but we also need to find an amount of work. So now we're asked, well, how much work to go from zero to four? Well, normally I said K root X, but I know what K is. So it's nine root X. And so what does this become? Well, the nine comes out, integral zero to four, X to one half DX. So that's nine times two thirds, X to the three halves from zero to four. And zero is nice and convenient. Uh, so let's see, that's nine times two thirds, four to the three halves. Well, four cubed is 64. Square root of 64 is eight, very good. If you don't like that computation, think of square root of four is two, two cubed is eight. And then zero is zero, because I got zero to the three halves. And we're pretty much done. We'll just clean this up a little bit because we like things to look pretty. The three goes into nine. Three times two is six. Six times eight is 48. And we'll go ahead and say foot pounds. Okay, good. And we're done. This one was not so bad. It was really just a testing, do you know how to do the, the work? Well, work is the integral of force times distance. So, so yes, we know how to do the work. Okay. This would have been a number one problem if we had ordered the problems from easiest to hardest. Uh, don't worry, we still have number six. Six is correctly positioned on this exam, this practice exam. All right, number five. Set up, but do not evaluate. Y'all, you'll notice something here. The words do not are like really, really capitalized. They're not bolded or underlined. They're not bolded or underlined, but they're capitalized. So if you see the words do not, that's a clue that you do not do something. You know, it's like you're tempted. It's like, I love after I set things up, I just have like this immediate reaction. I got to do the computation. No, no, no. Just set it up. I mean, if you want to waste your time and do the computation, uh, don't. You know, do it, do it at home. You know, like go home and be like, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this integral at home. Just set it up. Okay. Follow the instructions. All right, anyway, so we're going to find a volume, and this volume results from rotating the region between the x-axis and this parametric curve, t minus sine t, 1 minus cosine t, where t goes between 0 and 2 pi. Now, this isn't just any curve. This is actually a very famous curve. This is a, called the cycloid, and it deals with what happens if you were, for example, to uh, uh, maybe tape a, a bright color to a bike wheel 
and just follow where that tape goes as it moves forward, it would trace out a path like this. Now you probably think, well, this is, what's hard about this? You're just setting up an integral. Well, what's hard is it's, we're setting up an integral, but in a slightly different setting that we, we weren't taught. Because we know how to set up integrals if we have y equals f of x. That, we, we learned that. But this is setting up an uh, integral for a volume in parametric. We didn't learn that. So th what we're testing on is do we know how to actually adapt to a new situation. So let's think about it. What method makes sense to use here? Yeah, it makes sense to think, we should probably think of a little disk. So that when we spin this around, will form something easy to work with. So we're going to think, in the back of our heads, we're going to think a disk method. Well, we happen to know that disk method, there's a nice relationship. In fact, it was the very first slide. It said you integrate from somewhere to somewhere. You had a radius squared, and then you had like a thickness. So that was the, our first slide we talked about, and I was like, a versus B, in case you don't believe me, here it is. You know, these two formulas. If you remember this formula, it's like, well, you're out of luck because you don't have the right setting. But if you remember this formula, it's like, hey, let's think about how to adapt it. And I can see already I forgot my pi. Man, I'm, I'm someone who never skips pi. How could I ever forget it? Okay, so here we go. So now that we know what the formula is, we think, okay, let's adapt. So, the radius, well, if I'm thinking about this curve, this parametric curve is x of t, y of t, and, and it's not too hard to see what happens. If I plug in t equals zero, I'm at zero comma zero, so I'm actually traveling this way along the curve, just for reference. That might or may not be important. So, in terms of the radius and in terms of x and y, what is it? It's the y of t part. So the radius is the y of t. Now the bounds, we say, are going to become our parameterizations. So that's 0 and 2 pi. I should have started there. The thickness, we have to think about that. How do you find thickness with parameterization? Now you might say it's dt, but that's not right. It's like dx, right? It's a change in x. dt is a change in time. It's not, a, it's not a length. I need it. Thickness is a length. So, so I need this to sort of be dx. So how do we write dx in terms of parameterization? Yeah, so it turns out that it's the change in x times x prime of t times dt. So this is the same thing that showed up when we talked about area. So x prime of t is how much x is changing with respect to t. dt is how much t changes. So if I take the amount, rate of change of x with respect to t times the amount of change of t, what's left is the amount of change in x. So that's our dx. It's x prime of t dt. So now I say, hey, this is actually a pretty simple setup. Once I understand what's happening here, it's going to become y of t quantity squared times x prime of t dt. So I just have to plug in my pieces. So what is y of t? 1 minus cosine t squared. x prime of t? No, no, that was y of t. What is, it? What is x prime of t? Oh, it's still 1 minus cosine t. Wow, that's kind of cool. And dt. And so if I wanted to, I could just put those together. 0 to 2 pi of 1 minus cosine t quantity cubed dt. And could we integrate that? Absolutely we could. It would just uh, take us a while. And we have other problems to do. And we want to get those problems done. So this one is, is a testing on can you adapt? Do you understand the formulas? And are, do you understand them at a level where you say, hey, I know how to modify the formulas to fit the right situation? So you might see something like that on the test to some degree. Okay, that leads us one more problem. Cool. Now, this one. Find the area inside the curve r equals 1 plus cosine theta 
And outside the curve, r equals root 3 sine theta. See the image below. Now you're probably going to say, will we give you an image? And the answer is, if you have a problem like this, you may or may not, but if you do, we'll give you the picture. Because this is not a can you draw a picture test. This is can you use the tools test. All right. So looking at this, my first reaction is, huh, hmm. My second reaction is, okay, let's just get to work. So root 3 sine theta, that's something I've, I recognize. R equals something sine theta is always a circle. So this circle, that's the R equals root 3 sine theta. 1 plus cosine theta is also something that we've seen so often that we've come to recognize it, and that's this cardioid. And remember, the cardioid is the something that looks like a heart. If you turn it this way, it's sort of a heart-shaped. And, uh, you know, it's kind of early, I know, but just think of, you know, a few months from now on Valentine's Day, uh, you, can, you can tell your, your significant other, say, I, R equals 1 minus sine theta U. Now, you might say, that would never work. But I'll tell you what, I used it on my girlfriend in college, and we've been married now for like some number of years. <laughs> I don't remember. But, but it's been a lot while, you know. So it works. It works. OK, so anyways, I know my curves. I see they intersect here. I also see that at some point, I'm going to have to figure out this angle. Now, I could probably eyeball it and make a wild guess and get, get it right, because they can't give us too many angles. Uh, we're always going to pick an angle that that's, you've seen before. Anyone, can, can anybody eyeball and guess what that angle is? Pi over 3. Sounds about right. Now, you might say, that seems like cheating. OK, you, you could actually verify and say, well, plug in pi over 3 into both equations. And you can see you get square root of 3 times square root of 3 halves, which is 3 halves. Here you get 1 plus a half, which is 3 halves. And then you've actually justified it. But you're like, no, 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 I, I really want to really go all the way. OK, so here's the, the hardcore. Let's do it the long way. All right, so 1 plus cosine theta equals root 3 sine theta. So we want to find a way to figure out where they intersect. Now the problem is you got cosine and sine. They don't quite blend together. However, if you had cosine squared or sine squared, you have that wonderful Pythagorean identity. So let's square stuff. Square both sides. On the left-hand side, you get 1 plus 2 cosine theta plus cosine squared theta. On the right-hand side, you get 3 sine squared theta. And now you're probably thinking, well, great. Now we've added more terms. But what can we do with sine squared? It becomes cosine. How? Yeah, this becomes 3 times 1 minus cosine squared. And now everything's in terms of cosine. So that is good. So if you now rearrange, so for example, let's move all this stuff across. Uh, this would be minus 3 cosine squared moved across. So you're going to get 4 cosine squared theta. And then you'll get uh, plus 2 cosine theta. And you get 3, and from taking away from 1, minus 2 equals 0. You can divide everything by 2. So you get 2 cosine squared theta plus cosine theta minus 1 equals 0. And then you say, well, I hope it factors. And in our class, you can pretty much count on things factoring 99% of the time. And it does factor. Does anyone know how it factors? So one of them is a 2 cosine theta. So cosine theta plus 1, 2 cosine theta minus 1. So either cosine theta equals minus 1, which is actually this point right here, the origin, or cosine theta is 1 half. Oh, that's pi thirds. See? We get there eventually. All right. So that's only if you're the hardcore and you're like, I guessing, guessing seems like a sin. It's not a sin. It's actually a great tool of mathematics. Uh, you should learn it. It's a good tool. Now, let's think about what our integrals will be. We always think of coming from the origin. So we think about going out to the origin. And you'll notice that below the x-axis, what happens? Well, we always go out from the origin to the curve r equals 1 plus cosine theta. That's when we're below. 
What happens when we cross above? We go between curves. So below the axis, we always go from the origin straight to the curve. Above the axis, we go between curves. Well, what does that tell us we're going to have to do? We're going to do two integrals because we like doing integrals. OK, so what are our two integrals? Well, below the axis is from this angle, which is negative pi, to 0. And then remember, the area is 1 half, 1 plus cosine theta squared d theta. So that's the bottom half, plus we're going to do the top half, 0 to pi thirds. And this is a difference. So you're going to take 1 half, the outer part, which is 1 plus cosine theta squared, because the outer, remember in, in polar, it's furthest away, closest away. So furthest squared, subtract closest squared, because everything's in relationship to the origin. So 1 plus cosine theta squared minus root 3 sine theta squared d theta. OK, good. Now, if you wanted to, I don't know if you want to, you could think of this in a slightly different way. And it turns out you can get this by rearranging. Is you could say, well, look, another way to think about this equivalent is to say, let's go from negative pi to pi thirds of the 1 plus cosine theta squared, and then subtract off from 0 to pi thirds of the root 3 sine theta squared. They're the same. And if you look, in fact, that's exactly what we have. Because if you combine these two pieces here, that gives you this part. And if you take this piece here, that gives you that part. In terms of the picture, it's like it says, hey, just take this whole thing here, but then subtract off this piece. OK, so we're almost done, which is good, because we're almost out of time. All right. Well, I may not get full credit on this test, but I'll still get most points. Most of the points come to set it up. All right. What do you do? You square. So 1 plus 2 cosine theta plus cosine squared theta, d theta. And over here, it'll be 3 halves sine squared theta. Now, how do you handle cosine squared? Power reduction. Are you going to have that memorized? Yes, you are. In the, I, as, the, as I said before, you are strongly re encouraged in the most required sense of the word to know power reduction. OK, cosine squared becomes 1 half plus 1 half cosine 2 theta. Sine squared becomes 1 half minus 1 half cosine 2 theta. And uh, I only have 45 seconds left. Uh, dot, dot, dot. A miracle occurs. OK. All right. From here, it's just computation. We've done the hard part. Equals an answer. OK, we'll stop there. Good luck on the test. See you on the other side.